Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. Uh, we've been gone the last uh, five weeks. Uh, we spent three weeks here in Portland, and the last two weeks we were in uh, Michigan. A year ago, uh, this same Sunday, I had been gone for five weeks, just like this week, uh, but I came in that morning with uh, anxiety. The night before, I was sitting in our family room, and I saw a couple of yellow jackets flying on our back deck, and so I went out on the back, and I looked up at the eaves. They're two stories high, and I saw about five yellow jacket nests. So I got the ladder, got the hose, screwed the nozzle on it so I could spray them down. I climbed up on the ladder and began spraying them down, and, you know, it's two stories high, and I couldn't quite get them, so I went up one step too high on the ladder, and then I was getting most of them, but I couldn't quite get them all, so I went up two steps too high on the ladder, and I finally got the last one down, and then the ladder slipped, and I came crashing down. I caught myself on the deck, but I broke my wrist. So Jory and I spent uh, uh, that Saturday night a year ago at St. Vincent's Hospital, and uh, we finally came home about 11 p.m., and I began to get anxiety about the next morning here. I said, this is bad. I've been gone five weeks. People expect me to come back strong and ready to go and pumped up and, you know, healthy. And here I got a broken wrist. I'm in a sling. And if that's not bad enough, I broke it falling off a ladder. How dumb is that? Do I really have to tell them I broke it falling off a ladder? And so Jory said, she's driving the car, and she says, well, you could uh, tell them you broke it water skiing. I just skied that morning. And um, so I went with that last year. <laughs> Some of you were here, and so I said, I broke my uh, wrist water skiing. How many of you believe me? And just a few people's hands went up kind of timidly, and I said, yeah, you're right. I broke it falling off a ladder. Really, really stupid. But look. Everybody knows that's really lame, so let's make the official church story is I broke it water skiing. Agreed? Okay, everybody shakes their head. Well, the next week I came back and I said, you know, some of you objected to my claim that I broke my uh, wrist water skiing, so I brought you evidence. So I showed you a video of me water skiing, so well, here it is, uh, through, through the course in, in West Lynn. So the object in a slalom course is to get through the entrance buoy, and then there are six sets of double buoys. If you get around the outside buoy, you get two points, so that's 12 points, and then you have to get through the exit buoy, so a perfect score of 14. So the object in, in, in a slalom course is to slowly speed the boat up to 34 miles an hour, and then you start shortening the rope. Um, there are a lot of people in uh, Portland that are uh, way better slalom skiers than I am. I can name four in this church. Damon's one of them right down here in the front row. And, uh, uh, but I do pretty well in my category. My category is men who ski slalom courses, who are also pastors, <laughs> who are also 65 and over. I mean, there are like uh, two of us in the Pacific Northwest. We go to tournaments and we always get first and second. I've never figured out why we do so well. <clears throat> so then I, so I showed you. I said, okay, so what we did is I made the course, perfect score, 27 miles an hour, perfect score, 28, perfect score, 29. And then here's what happened on the next run. I said, hey, see that? That's when I broke my wrist. So no more talk about me falling off a ladder. I would never do anything that lame. So. so why did I have so much anxiety about what you would think of me coming in with a sling around my neck? I mean, most of you probably didn't think anything about it. Most of you, your, your response was compassion. Anxiety is a low-grade fear. It's so much, not so much a storm but the certainty that one is coming. It's not the sight of a wolf, but the suspicion of one, two, or five. Around every turn, one is coming. You're sure of it. Trouble is coming, so you don't sleep well. You don't laugh as much as you used to. 
You don't hum a tune as you go through your day. Anxiety is a flood of what ifs. What if I can't do it? What if I don't have enough money? What if I don't make the team? What if I don't meet anybody? I signed up on a dating site. What if I don't meet anybody? Anxiety takes our energy, our peace of mind. It makes our eyes twitch, our blood pressure rise. It makes our necks hurt and our jaws and our our backs. According to the American Academy of Family Physicians, two-thirds of office visits to family doctors are prompted by stress-related symptoms. This year, 50 million Americans will feel the effects of a panic attack or a phobia. Anxiety disorders in the U.S. are the number one health problem among women and second only to alcohol and drug abuse among men. The United States is the most anxious nation in the world. How can that be? Our cars are safer. We regulate our food, our water, our electricity. Citizens in other countries experience one-fifth the anxiety that we do despite having fewer of life's basic necessities. In fact, when these less anxious developing world citizens immigrate to the United States, soon they're as anxious as the rest of us. There's something in our culture that causes us stress. doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, married or single, young or old, you're stressed. Our young people today are feeling it. The average child today experiences the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the 1950s. Kids have more clothes, electronics, and opportunities than any time in history. Yet by the time they leave for college, they're they're as stressed out, they're tighter than kites. Why are we so stressed? Change, for one thing, researchers estimate that we have experienced more change in the last 30 years than in the last 300 years. Just think how much uh, technology has changed. News we used to learn about days after an event happened, now we learn about in just a few minutes on our cell phones. We're just processing one crisis when we learn about another one. We also move faster than ever before. Our ancestors traveled as far as a horse or camel could take them during daylight. Today, we jet through time zones like there are neighborhood streets. And without exception, we're getting older. A widower invited a widow to dinner and just spontaneously. During dinner, he asked her, will you marry me? And she said, yes, yes. And he went home all excited, and, and then, but, but as the night went on, he got troubled because he couldn't remember whether she said yes or no. <laughs> so the next day, he went back to her, and he says, hey, did you say yes? She said, yes, I said yes, but I'm so glad you came back because I was so troubled last night. I couldn't for the life of me remember who asked me. <laughs> <clears throat> You would think Christians would be free from anxiety, but we're not. We wonder if the Apostle Paul is clueless about reality when he writes, do not be anxious about anything. Be less anxious would seem to be more realistic, but he doesn't give us any wiggle room. He says, don't be anxious at all, none. Are you anxious? Answer yes or no to these questions. Just answer to yourself. Are you laughing less than you once did? Do you see problems in every promise? Would those who know you best describe you as increasingly negative and critical? Do you assume that something bad is going to happen? Do you dilute and downplay good news with doses of your version of reality? Many days would you rather stay in bed than get up? 
Do you magnify the negative and dismiss the positive? Given the chance, would you avoid any interaction with humanity for the rest of your life? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I have four verses for you to read. These are the most famous verses in the book of Philippians. We've been studying Philippians in our series, Fixer Upper, how to fix up the way we think. If you want to use our Bibles <clears throat> under the seats, it's on page 1,181. But right now we're going to read what's on the screen, and I want to invite you to stand in honor of God's Word and read it with me. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Lord God, thank you for these verses. We confess to you that we are stressed. Every one of us here has something we're worrying about. We don't want to live that way, so we're open to hearing from you today. We invite you to do surgery in our minds, our hearts. We're ready to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Four verses with three commands and one amazing promise. The peace of God. If anyone had reason to be anxious, it was the Apostle Paul. He received 39 lashes on five different occasions. He was beaten with rods on three. He once was left for dead. He endured shipwrecks, storms, and starvation. As he writes these words, he is in a prison in Rome facing trial before the Roman emperor. Nero knows that he can curry favor with Roman citizens by killing Christians, of, whom, of which Paul is the best known in the world. He also has the worries of all the newborn Christians that he has helped plant in new churches. Yet to read his words, you'd think he had just arrived at a Hawaiian five-star resort. He never complains in this letter to the Philippians. Instead, he talks about his joy 19 times. And here, peace. What's his secret? He says you can know God's peace. Paul tells us three things that will bring us peace. Now, you can walk into any bookstore and go to the self-help section, you'll find books on how to deal with stress. Learn to breathe deeply, eat right, get exercise, find a hobby like mine, water skiing, go on trips, vacations. That's how you reduce stress. But this is God's counsel. God's counsel comes in at a higher level. He says three things, and these things are are powerful. If you put these into practice, they will be huge. The first one is rejoice in the Lord. Paul begins, read this with me. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Paul pulls no punches here. He uses the word Cairo that he uses 19 times in this letter, and he puts it in the present imperative. In other words, do it all the time. Keep doing it throughout the day. And if the verb tense was not enough, he removed the expiration date. He said, do it always. And if that were not enough, he repeats it. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. You say, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can rejoice always. I don't think I can be perpetually happy. I mean, with stuff like the shootings in El Paso and Dayton, bad medical diagnoses, 
things like drunk drivers, reaping destruction in people's lives. I don't know if I can do that. Well, Paul doesn't ask us to do that. He says rejoice in the Lord. This isn't a call to being happy all the time. It's a call to believing in God, that He exists and He loves us and He's merciful and He's in control. When it comes to dealing with anxiety, understanding God's sovereignty is huge. Anxiety is often perceived chaos. If we sense we are victims of unseen, turbulent, random forces, we're troubled. Psychologists verified this when they studied soldiers in combat in World War II, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. They found that after 60 straight days of combat, infantrymen uh, were just wasted emotionally. They were just wrecked. And that makes sense. They're under a constant barrage of machine gun fire, sniper fire. They're driving along and they, they see IEDs. When our son Mark came home from Afghanistan, he had post-traumatic stress syndrome. It became really obvious one night when we were driving home from Seattle, and he was driving, and he pulled off about halfway home. He says, Dad, I can't do this anymore. Every light I see coming at me, I, I, I see an IED. So we understood why soldiers would be wasted emotionally. The surprise was the relative calm of fighter pilots. Their jobs are very dangerous too. But 93% of them said they love their jobs. Very happy in what they do. What made the difference? A fighter pilot has his hand on the control. He feels like his fate is in his hands. So the, the conclusion of their study was if you see yourself as being able to control your destiny, you experience calm. If you see you have no control, you're troubled. From the cockpit, they felt like they were in control. But that's not the way it works in real life. Uh, we're not in control. There are so many things outside of our control uh, ladies, have you been able to change your husband? How's that working for you? You can't control anybody. There are so many things outside of our control. It feels like our world is spinning out of control, like Mark prayed in his prayer. After the terrorist attack on 9-11, we concluded that Afghanistan had become a breeding ground for terrorism. The problem, terrorism. The solution, strike Afghanistan. But today, we're still f worried about terrorism, but, you know, we have these shootings like in El Paso. We have conflict with China, Iran, North Korea, Russia, even Venezuela. The world is getting more and more dangerous, and it feels out of control. But Paul tells us, that, he doesn't tell us there are no dangers in the world. What Paul calls us to do is to rejoice in the Lord, that He's in control, that He's sovereign. Rejoicing in the Lord is also called praise. Praise is a big theme in the Bible. In the face of praise, worry melts like ice in the sun. Do you spend time praising God every day? First thing in the morning when I wake up, <clears throat> I praise God. And then uh, very quickly, I like to spend some time with Christ in the Bible, and I begin my time by praising God. I urge you every day to have what I call chair time, where you find your favorite chair and you begin by praising God. And then you spend some time in the Bible using maybe our journal that's your learning about that God is his sovereign. 
but he loves you. The second thing Paul tells us is to refuse to worry. So Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. Uh, the second step to conquering anxiety and discovering God's amazing peace is to refuse to worry. You say, I could worry, but I refuse to do so. I want you to take your fingers for a moment. Just place them on each side of your temple, everybody, and repeat after me this prayer. Thank you, Lord, for my amygdala. That word just kind of flows off the tongue, doesn't it? Thank you, Lord, <clears throat> for the two almond-shaped neural clusters that reside inside my brain. I wouldn't be alive without them. That's true. The amygdala is what warn you to duck when a ball's flying towards your head or a frisbee at the beach. It's what causes you to step back on the curb when you hear a car honk. You just do it automatically. You don't think about it. It's like our mental alarm system. Alarm system in your home tells you that there's an intruder. You need to do something. So, the amygdala warns us without us even thinking about it. You don't, you, don't, you don't step out in the street and just kind of look at the car and say, Whoa, that car's big and I'm little. That car's fast. I'm slow. No, you just immediately step back without thinking about it. The amygdala causes your pupils to dilate so you can see better. Your heart to pump faster so more blood goes into your system. Your lungs to breathe more quickly so you get more oxygen. It releases adrenaline so you're quicker, stronger. We like our amygdala. But we don't like hypersensitive ones. Just like we don't want an alarm system in our home that goes off with a gust of a breeze or the bark of a dog. When Jory and I bought our house in Michigan, we called ADT to put in an alarm system. We live here in Portland. We're not there very much. We need to have some way we can monitor what's going on there. So they came in and they said, well, you already had an alarm system here, so we'll just kind of co-op the one you had before and put on a few bells and whistles and you'll be good to go. Sounds great. The problem was they couldn't locate all the sensors from the previous alarm system. And each sensor is controlled by a battery. Once that battery dies, it begins to chirp. And so all through the year, I've been getting calls. Uh, it shows that your you know, family room northwest window has been breaking. Is everything okay? And I'm thinking, well, how would I know? I'm here asleep in Portland. It was very irritating. So every time we go back, you know, we have ADT out. And I say, you got to find these sensors. This is craziness. We don't want an alarm system like that that's always going off. Nor do we want that kind of thing in our minds. Amygdala that is overactive is sort of like an alarm system that never shuts down. You know, we, we get a cough and we think, oh, I've got cancer. The stock market goes down one day, and we think, oh, we're in a full-out recession. Your kid stays out too late one night, and you think, my kid's going to be on drugs before they go to college. We don't want that hyper sense of sensitivity all the time. We need some anxiety that keeps us from danger, but we can't be in a high state of alert all the time. That causes stress. So how can we shut down our tendency to be anxious about so many things? Here's what Paul says. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Those phrases are connected. The reason you don't need to be anxious about anything is because the Lord is near. 
If you've given your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and lives inside you. Christ is with you. He is in control. A couple of years ago, we were vacationing in Michigan, and our son Luke was with us, and we went out to work in the yard one morning. And uh, we have a, uh, a large river rock uh, fireplace that's very pretty in the front of the house, but the bushes had grown up to about four feet high, and we're looking at it, and we're saying, this is, this is crazy. Why have that blocking it? So let's pull it out. So we pull on it, and it doesn't move. So then we dig around it with a shovel, and then we pull on it, and it still doesn't move. So Luke says, why don't I go to the neighbor and see if we can borrow his truck, and maybe he has a chain. So sure enough, he has a chain. We wrap that around the bush, one pull, and the bush is out. The reason we get so anxious, so worked up, is because we're trying to deal with our problems on our own strength. We need God's truck strength. When we remember the Lord is near, we no longer need to worry. The third thing Paul says we need to do is to pray to God for help. Read this with me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Instead of worrying, we're to pray. You say, God, I'm, I'm worrying about this. I don't want to do that. So, God, if you would be merciful, I pray that you wouldn't have this happen, but you could help this to happen. You say, well, I pray, but I still worry. It doesn't do any good. But Paul says he doesn't ask us to just offer any kind of prayer. The word he uses for petition means to offer God specific requests. If you want to beat worry, you have to be specific in your prayers. Why do specific requests destroy worry? Well, for one, specific prayer is a serious prayer. If I call you up and ask, uh, can I talk to you about something? You might not take me seriously. But if I call you up and say, I'll be over in 10 minutes, I'd like to talk to you, you know I'm serious. Also, specific prayer is an opportunity to see God work. God only answers prayers that bring Him honor. If we offer a specific request, it's going to be pretty obvious if God answered that and will be likely to give God the praise. So He's more likely to grant that request. When Abraham, the Old Testament patriarch, was about to die, he said to his servant, Promise me you will find a wife for my son Isaac from our people back home. Remember, God had uh, 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 told Abraham to move to the land of Canaan. He says, don't, don't find a wife in the land of Canaan. Go back to our people to find fellow believers. And so he goes back, and here's his prayer as he goes back. Then he prayed, Lord God, this is uh, my Abraham's servant, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. That would be a kind woman, a woman that says, yeah, I can see that you need water, but of course your animals do as well. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. He couldn't have been more specific in his prayer. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. Further, specific prayer lightens our load. Specific requests alleviate worry because once we've made our request, we can leave it with God, believing that he's going to answer our prayer. Or if he doesn't, he'll give us something better. Remember, Jesus says God only gives good gifts. If you ask for bread, what father is going to give you a snake? If earthly fathers know how to give good gifts, how much more will God give good gifts? So if you ask for something specific and God says, you know, I've got something better, you can know that either he'll answer your request or he'll give you a better answer. 
If you want to break free from worry, don't offer general requests like, Lord, help me have a good day. I mean, how in the world are you going to know if God answered that prayer? Pray specifically for situations you know you're going to face. Apostle Paul says when we make our specific requests, we're to do it with thanksgiving. Read this. By prayer and petition, <clears throat> with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. You don't just pray about the problems you're facing, but you're careful to thank Him and say, God, by the way, you've been so good to me over the months, over the years. Thank you. <clears throat> When you rejoice in the Lord, refuse to worry, and make specific requests about every situation, an amazing thing happens. Read this with me. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You don't just receive peace from God. You receive the peace of of God. God's very peace invades your life. I'll bet you're facing a situation today that has you worried, stressed out. When mariners describe a tempest that no sailor can escape, they call it a perfect storm. Not perfect in the sense of being ideal, but the perfect in the sense of having several factors. Hurricane-like winds, plus a sudden drop of temperature, maybe 10 or 15 degrees, plus pelting rain. It would be bad enough to just to have the wind, but when they have the temperature and the rain as well, it's a perfect storm. You don't have to be a sailor to experience a perfect storm. All you need is to go through a divorce plus a bad medical diagnosis. To go through a relationship breakup plus your college application is rejected. Maybe you lose your job plus there's a recession. I mean, all of us can handle one problem, but when we have two or three at the same time, it's like waves coming at us, wave after wave, and we wonder if we're going to survive. You will survive. In fact, you can know God's peace. As we do our part by fixing the way we think, by rejoicing in the Lord, refusing to worry, and praying specifically about every situation, God will do his part. He will give us his peace. Thank you, Father, for this amazing promise that your peace that transcends all understanding will invade our lives. Lord, we want to have that. We are stressed. We worry about things. We confess that. We don't want to live that way this week. So help us to follow your counsel. I want you to pray right now before we go. Would you tell God what you're worried about that you're going to face today or this week? What you'd like to see happen? Tell him you're going to refuse to worry about it. You're going to rejoice that he is in control. And you're going to pray specifically about it. You do that right now. Lord God, we don't want to be people that are tighter than kites, imagining worries every turn throughout the day, but we want to experience your peace, so help us to live this way. In Jesus' name we pray.